partners of Mix It Print Studio. And on behalf of Catherine Kernan, Kathy, would you stand up, please? And Jane Goldman. I don't know if Jane Goldman is here, but she, there she is, back there. Um, we, as the three partners, are absolutely delighted to welcome you to our panel, Impact and Innovation in Contemporary Printmaking. Um, some of you may know that William Kentridge is uh, giving a lecture tonight as well, and we feel badly for him that he didn't know perhaps that he was up against this exciting event. Um, before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to acknowledge a few people without whom this panel and exhibition would not exist. Susan Glover and Beth Prindle of Special Exhibitions at the Boston Public Library, and especially Karen Schaff's Assistant Curator of Prints and Drawings here at the BPL, who curated She curated this amazing show, which if you haven't seen it, there will be time after the panel discussion to um, feast your eyes. It's in three locations, the Johnson Lobby, the Wigan Gallery on the third floor, and the changing exhibition space in the McKim Building. I also want to thank Hetty Siebel, a mix-it artist who helped to organize this panel. The evening will go. The evening will go as follows. After my brief introductions, we will hear the comments of a critic, Patricia Phillips. Then we will hear the comments from Andrew Raftery, our artist, and finally, our curator, Susan Dackerman. We will then ask the panelists to discuss the issues that they've raised among themselves, and we will open up the floor at that, after that to questions and answers. For those of you who are interested, the entire presentation as well as the Q&A section is being taped, and in a couple of weeks that will be available for your pleasure and viewing. Um, and you should go to the BPO website and the Mixit website to find information about when you and how you can view the tape. Because um, the, we are taping, when we have Q&A, we ask you to use the microphones that will be um, available for you in the audience. So with that roadmap, allow me to introduce our distinguished panel of scholars. Patricia Phillips, who will be speaking first, is the Associate Provost at the Rhode Island School of Design. Patricia Phillips' research and critical writing involve contemporary public art, architecture, sculpture, landscape, and the intersection of these areas. Since 1980, her essays and reviews have been published in Art Forum, Art in America, Flash Art, Sculpture, and Public Art Review. She's also published books and collect collected essays published by Rizzoli International, Princeton Architectural Press, MIT Press, Actor Press, Bay Press, and Routledge. One of her most recent publications, which I'm very happy to do a little show and tell, is the award-winning Ursula van Rydensgaard, published by Prestel last year in 2011. Patricia has received individual grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in Visual Arts. She has lectured nationally and internationally, including the Seattle Art Museum, Harvard University, Institute for Contemporary Arts, University of Pennsylvania, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Walker Art Center, Teachers College at Columbia University, uh, Melbourne Institute in uh, Australia, she's at, lectured in Stockholm and London. From 2002 to 2007, she served as Editor-in-Chief of the Art Journal, a quarterly publication on contemporary art published by the CAA. She is on the Editorial Advisory Board of Public Art Review and Public Art Dialogue. After Patricia gives her presentation, we have Andrew Raftery. Andrew Stein Raftery is a printmaker specializing in narrative scenes of contemporary American life. Trained in painting and printmaking at Boston University and Yale, Andrew has focused on Buren engraving for the past 12 years. Publishing the portfolios Suit Shopping in 2002 and Open House in 2008. Both projects were exhibited at Mary Ryan Gallery in New York 
and were collected by the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Cleveland Museum of Art, Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the British Museum. In 2003, Andrew received the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award, and in 2008, he was a fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. He was elected to membership in the National Academy in 2009. Art historical research is closely aligned with Andrew's studio practice. In his position as professor of printmaking at RISD, he often collaborates with the museum on exhibitions and educational programs. Recently, he was the consulting curator for the brilliant line, The Journey of the Modern American Graver, which was published in the fall 2009 by the RISD Museum, and it also showed at the Block Museum at Northwestern University in Evanston. This is not just called The Brilliant Line, it is absolutely brilliant, and if you can get a chance to read this and avail yourself of it, it is absolutely magnificent. Um, Andrew is the recipient of RISD's John Fraser Award for Excellence in Teaching. Last but not least, we have Susan Dackerman. Susan is the Carl A. Weyerhaeuser Curator of Prints and the Director of Academic Programs at the Harvard Art Museums. Previously, she served as Curator of Prints, Drawings, and Photographs at the Baltimore Museum of Art. In addition to her curatorial work, she teaches a graduate seminar at Harvard University. Susan has been the recipient of various grants and fellowships, including ones from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Samuel H. Kress Foundation, the Getty Foundation, Clark Art Institute, and the Center for the Advanced Study in Visual Arts. Susan is a specialist in the history of early modern Northern European prints and has organized numerous exhibitions in the field. Most recent was the absolutely spectacular exhibition, Prints in the Pursuit of Knowledge in Early Morning, Modern Europe, which examined the role that artists played in the scientific investigations of the 16th century. I can tell you that this was so wonderful that it inspired many of my students at Mass College of Art and Design to go and uh, make contemporary versions of the wonderful work they saw in your show. So now that we know who these distinguished panelists are, allow me to say a few words about what they will address tonight. I gave all of the panelists the following quote from the catalog from the new MoMA show called Printout. And here's the quote. While printmaking may very well lose its distinctiveness as a traditional artistic medium, many of its key characteristics, its reproducibility, capacity for distribution, and even its collaborative nature, remain essential to art making. Looking at the vast range of extraordinary projects produced in the past two decades, it is perhaps not the disappearance of the print medium that we are witnessing, but rather the advent of a time in which prints will simply be called art. In other words, there's this great irony that only when printmaking is part of other works is printmaking given the imprimatur of being art. Then, in a searing critique of the show, New York Times critic Ken Johnson says, Quote, the intimate fine art print is an endangered species. So tonight we are asking each of the panelists to address the role of printmaking in today's complex interrelated art projects, and we begin with Patricia Phillips. Sorry, just a moment here. Having a little trouble getting out of this thing. Hold on a second. Just a hand. 
this escape. Sorry about that. It's okay. Ah, uh, there we go. Thank you so much. That's all right. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and, um, and uh, got here early enough with my um, wonderful and respected colleague, Andrew Raftery. So we had time to see the uh, exhibition, and I really want to um, congratulate all of the curators and artists who were involved in putting together such a remarkable and expansive and challenging uh, exhibition of, of, of print and what um, print-specific and print-related work might be and what, how we might think about it at this very moment. Um, I'm honored to be here and thank Randy, my dear friend, for such a warm welcome and, and gracious invitation, uh, um, introduction. And I think the introduction will certainly give you some sense of my rather um, eclectic and far-flung interests. Um, and I imagine you'll have a much more sort of focused and immersive um, experience and investigation of the print with, with Susan, who I met for the first time this evening, but whose work I've admired um, a great deal. So I, again, I'm, my, my, my comments are going to be somewhat discursive, and I think it's related to the kind of work that I typically do as a critic that is often looking at um, the relationship between different kinds of media, looking at interstitial spaces, looking at the blurring of boundaries that might happen between fields and disciplines, as well as in the public realm and public space, which, which is an area which I've written about quite a bit. Um, but I also am trying to think about some ideas and concepts of metaphors that try to connect um, these comments this evening that I want to share with you. Um, it was interesting to me that when I went to see the printout show and, and Ellen Gallagher's wonderful work at the Museum of Modern Art and then was um, encouraged by the, the passage that Randy sent to all of us, after seeing the print shows, I actually then wandered around the museum and I ended up in an exhibition called Foreclosed, which was a series of artist projects, architects projects, looking at new ways of thinking about housing and housing in the economy. And I looked at a project by Zago Architects, um, who was looking at a, a, a new way of thinking about the subdivision. And it was interesting, and I think it was a totally fortuitous moment, but they described a metaphor that they used to think about this new way of thinking about housing and architecture and interstitial spaces as this concept of misregistration. Um, a moment in the printing process, an error, if you will, in a printing process that leads to blurred images. And they, and they took that idea of, of error, of blurriness, of relaxed boundaries to start to think about a different way of negotiating architecture and, and public space. And I've always been kind of curious about the unpredictable, um, perhaps the undesirable, um, the um, unexpected that might happen within the art process. So that's sort of one thought I'd like us to keep in mind for just a moment. I also, when I think about prints, when I think about the public realm, I think about the idea of pressure and resistance and how much art often emerges from those kinds of ideas and circumstances. And I was looking at a wonderful passage written by the um, poet and author Anne Lauterbach, and she's citing um, um, Gertrude Stein here, Gertrude, and I quote, Gertrude Stein's mantra, nothing changes from generation to generation except the things seen, and that makes a composition, has long resonated with me as a way for contemporary artists to think about their present moment in relation to their subjects, materials, and forms. I have taken the phrase, the thing seen, in its widest possible construction, the way world's variety, the world's variety comes into focus through myriad events and facts, near and far in an artist's work. I call this focus pressure. How, I ask students, does world press on your consciousness? 
It is, of course, an abstraction, this world. It holds in its five letters both the inscrutable and the illimitable. But artists find ways to make world through the subject and material, inscrutable and through form, limited. So this notion, again, of myth, this metaphor of pressure has been a very generative idea for me as I think about prints and how we might, I always might organize these comments this, this evening. I was, as someone who is not a scholar of the print, I was thinking, how am I going to actually get into this, into this idea? And I was, um, I was rescued, um, actually, by a wonderful essay that came out. It's in the winter issue, the winter 2011 issue of the Art Journal. It's by Sarah Suzuki, who's an associate curator of prints and illustrated books at the Museum of Modern Art. The essay is titled, Print People, A Brief Taxonomy of Contemporary Printmaking. And, you know, she started to write, she writes about the democratic reach, the earthbound price points, and, in, and the inherently collaborative nature of the print, all ideas that have been very generative for me in my thinking and writing. She also talks about, um, about the print and how we might sometimes perennially consider it on some sort of verge of obsolescence, fighting for relevancy in this um, increasingly diverse and discursive um, contemporary art world. Um, but she goes on to write, and I do want to just read this very brief passage because I thought it was just a wonderful way of sort of summing up this moment. And I quote, it is certainly true that printed art has its own trajectories and histories that both align with and deviate from the arc of the history of art, and that print people must protect these specific legacies and preserve them. But rather than seeing this as a more bund effort, I would argue that printmaking is currently experiencing something of a stealth renaissance, finding ways of insinuating itself into the larger activities of contemporary art without necessarily announcing itself as doing so. The conceptual concerns of the mediums, collaboration, process, copy, original, reproduction, and sequence and seriality are wholly present in work across disciplines, resulting in exciting new projects, both print, made and distributed within the realm of print people, and printed, incorporating tools or aspects of printmaking, but within a broader print, non-print specific pure, pure, uh, pure view. At the same time, the traditional roles of printer and publisher are shifting and new spheres of interest are on the rise. This essay seeks to mop out some of the basic geography of the contemporary print landscape. She also made a very interesting dis distinction between print-specific and print-related, and I think if I had to sort of characterize my, my remarks, they would be print-related. Um, I've been very intrigued with, again, the very sort of discursive, distributive way that various artists, often in the public realm, have used the print um, as a as a as a vehicle to uh, as a vehicle as a conceptual catalyst as a cultural probe. Um, in many respects, I've probably been less interested in sort of the valorization of the print and more in interested in the um, what I consider the inherent agency of the print in the in the public realm. So I want to show you a few um, a few images and. Um, try to focus my remarks a little bit more. Okay. Um, I've had the opportunity over the years to write on a number of occasions about the work of, of Alfredo Jarr, and it's been a remarkable privilege for me to see the trajectory of his work over the past 25 years and to um, encounter new work and to re revisit old ideas. And this is a project that um, has continued to resonate for me, and it's also because it's actually rather different from a lot of his work, which often he started his early practice using light box and reflective surfaces and, and uh, very compelling transparencies. And, and here he uh, constructed a large rectangular space um, of, uh, and, and filled it with a million Urzat um, fake passports. This immense austerity was produced by an enormous accumulation of passports. The great collection symbolized 
the restrictive nationalism of Finland at the time, this is in 1995, compared to other Europe European nations, Finland had the lowest number of immigrants and refugees. Maintaining inhospitable, restrictive policies, Finland was, has, was gar had guarded its status quo at a time when other countries were re-examining their moral and political positions on refugees and exiles. The one million documents were, of course, replicas of actual passports. Assembled in a formidable arrangement, they collectively represented the number of people who have been turned away from Finland. Because of the high security threat, JAR's installation was all walled off behind tall glass. But this did not discourage one act of critical solidarity. One day, a single visitor tossed his very own passport into the installation in a vivid demonstration of, of his political and psychological affiliation with the million aliens excluded at that time by Finland's um, policies. Um, going back to 1986, this is a project that a number of you may know was an installation that JAR actually did in the Spring Street subway station. And again, thinking about print related, thinking about the idea of, a, of the sort of the, the, the material reality as well as the methodologies of the print as a kind of cultural probe. But these were, he basically commandeered all of the advertising space of the subway platform, both sides of the, um, of the tracks, and inc included images that he had taken at Sierra Pilata, which was one of the largest open air gold mines in the world in uh, the Brazilian rainforest. So there were pictures of the miners. Um, periodically, the artist would go down every few days and put up new posters showing the price of um, the changing price of gold on the world market. There was absolutely no, um, there were no captions. People were sort of left there to try to discern what they felt that these images were about. I might also add that the Spring Street Station was on the way down to Wall Street, so you're suddenly faced with these um, very different um, related but um, uh, vividly contrasting notions of economy. Um, let me just move on to this next image. Again, just some of the images that he in, in, included. And again, what was very interesting about this installation is its, um, its um, dispersiveness, this notion of a kind of distributed media, the fact that people could s look at these images while waiting for a train, or that they could also have a very fil filmic or cinematic event as they pass through on an express train seeing these images. I also, it's important to remember that Jar is not only has used the print quite a bit in his work and especially his work in public space, but he's also a filmmaker. What has also interested me about the print over the years is its incredible sort of adaptability and, and flexibility. And here you have David Hammonds, an artist whose work has resonated for me for many years. And here he is. Um, he did a whole series of, of body prints in the um, late 70s and early 80s, where he, he either co covered his body with ink or with Vaseline or other kinds of viscous materials in order to create prints. And again, this, this notion of, of adaptability and um, the promiscuity of, of, of the print as a media or methodology was, was um, something that interested me a great deal. For me, a precursor of this work actually was the um, very um, famous uh, performance that Vito Acconci did actually in 1970 called Trademarks, where seated nude on the floor, the artist repeatedly bit with painful pressure parts of his body his teeth left deep impressions on his own flesh, unlike prints that generally aspire to longevity. Akanchi's impressions gradually disappeared as the skin recovered and reinstated its taut, smooth form. It would be a critical miscalculation to attribute Akanchi's performance solely to an investigation of the print. Trademarks should be understood within a range of body-oriented interven interventions of artists of this period. But the work insistently and disquietly demonstrates the extremes of physical, emotional, social, 
an aesthetic pressure of the artist as mark maker. And I'm ending with just several images by um, the remarkable artist uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, and here the, for me the dialectic, the generative dialectic is public private, um, dispersive media. Uh, as many of you know, um, Gonzalez Torres did installations in museums. He would often leave hard candies, often equivalent to the weight of his partner who had died from AIDS. Um, shortly before the artist actually himself also died from AIDS. Uh, he would also leave stacks of posters and invite visitors to take a poster away with them, a printed material away with them. It was the obligation of the museum to continue to uh, refill these piles of posters so that they were available throughout the duration of the exhibition. Um, again, this notion of how print can be this very aggressive and also very uh, generous kind of um, generative material. This is another project that he did where um, using a number of billboards throughout Manhattan, um, this image of uh, the double bed with the impression of two heads on the, on the pillows. Again, another sort of um, uh, remembrance, um, a, a sort of grieving for loss. Again, distributed throughout public space using the print as this ubiquitous um, material and a final stack of posters for the public to take. Let me just. Um, well, forget that. But So I wanted to just um, end with the idea of distributive media, which is something that Seth Price has written about quite a bit in his, art, his essay, Dispersion. Um, he writes, distributed media can be defined as social information circulating in theoretically unlimited quantities in the common market, stored or accessed via portable devices such as books and magazines, records and compact discs, videotapes and DVDs, personal computers and data diskettes. New strategies are needed to keep up with commercial distribution, decentralization and dispersion. You might some fight something in order to understand it. Um, to me, the, the, um, the challenge and the um, excitement about the, the print is its way to, its, its capacity in a very stealth-like way, as, as Sarah Suzuki mentioned in her article, to intervene in a number of existing venues um, in, in media, in public space, and um, and in our in our in our consciousness. So I think I will stop there and turn this over to Andrew. Um, is our next presenter. So I close this, right? Okay, for that. I'll close this. No, I guess that's not the thing. Hmm. Minimize it. There's the little, that this one? Yeah. The second one. Okay, good. And there's mine. No, right here. Oh, this one? This right down here. Because this one, because this one was mine. Are they on there? Oh, I'll go to that one. Perfect. There it is. Thank you very much. So um, I wanted to start out by um, something I think a lot of artists do think about is this whole idea of the art world. And I'm showing this image by Crispin van de Passa 
It's um, actually of a mausoleum, but of course it's in the shape of a pyramid. And I think many of us think about the art world as a kind of a pyramid, where there's just a very, there's some people at the top, the most successful, the most famous people, and then that sort of graduates down until there are those sort of supporting players. And there's these kinds of, not just hierarchies of artists and galleries, but also um, hierarchies of um, media as well. And I think filmmakers sometimes feel a little beleaguered, like they're not at that top there. But I think um, thinking about being, what it's like to go through a lifetime as an artist and thinking about kind of a metaphor for the art world, I like to think about this whole idea of the art world as an ecosystem. And so I'm showing this print by um, a French engraver named Jean-Emile Laboureur, and um, it's called The Entomologist. And I do think it's a kind of a way that we can think about how um, all of these worlds within worlds can exist and um, really make a contrib contribution and blend in with each other. And certainly um, what we see with um, Mixit as it's survived and flourished over these years as a kind of an ecosystem in so many ways and I think is, is very inspiring. And um, you know the quote that Randy gave us, I have a quote here too. And I'm going to read it to you. Um, Today, the old style of line engraving, metazotint, and reproductive etching have for all practical purposes ceased to exist. The various forms of etching lead a precarious existence among artists who happen to like them as media for the exhibition of their skill and deafness in hallowed techniques. And there are still collectors who take an interest in the current production of minor works of art in antiquated and therefore highly respectable techniques. But as a medium that still has work to do in the world, etching, aside from its utilization in the photographic processes, is over with. Today, it has no more social or economic importance than has the ability to drive a foreign hand in front of a coach. Wood engraving and woodcutting are in much the same straits as etching and engraving all have become precious, accomplishments of which their practitioners are vain, much like the acquisition of a good French accent by one who has nothing to say in any language. Now, um, that's from a book that was published in 1953 um, by um, William Ivins, and he was the founding curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's from a very interesting book called Prints and Visual Communications that provides a wonderful um, theoretical idea about how um, Mark language existed in, um, and grew over time, but it also, modernist that he was, it has this kind of um, technological determinism. Um, but in 1953, they were all, he was just saying this, and we all know that he was wrong. Prints have continued to exist, etching has continued to be important, and so many other things have grown from it. And so I wanted to show you some prints that I've really enjoyed over the past few years and think about um, why artists may have turned to these media. And this is a print by James Sienna, and it's an engraving. And um, it's a wonderful engraving in that I, I actually remember seeing it at the Whitney Biennial, and it was the only print set in the Biennial, and it was engraving, and I was so um, proud and uplifted. Um, but I think the reason an artist like James Sienna would choose to do a print, but not just any print, this particular print, which is an engraving. Um, it was printed and published by Harlan and Weaver in New York. And it's, um, I know the impression that we have at the RISD Museum is actually printed on a very delicate blue sheen collet. So to me, artists turn to printmaking media because of the very specific choices that it allows them to make. And just like contemporary sculptors, will turn to so many materials, to this broad range of materials that have come to include sculpture. Um, printmakers make these very specific choices. And I, I took a picture of this with the microscope at the RISD Museum to think about um, James Sienna's choices because those engraved lines start with a point and then slightly swell. Um, he obviously wanted that particular relief of the ink on the paper. It's a very, very kind of specific choices and I think that's a lot of reasons why our students um, at art schools fall in love with printmaking. It allows, printmaking allows artists to make things in a very, very particular way. And I know that's why I do it. 
Um, one thing Ivan says that I think is very um, important is this whole idea about having something to say. Now, of course, we don't want to look at a print that has nothing to say. And um, an artist that I've really enjoyed very much over the years, and she just gave a talk at RISD yesterday, which was super inspiring, is um, Diane Victor. And she's a South African artist. Um, she has been in the US for a while preparing for a show at David Crutt in New York. And this etching is from her series. It's an ongoing series called Disasters of Peace. And she talked about it yesterday. She said that um, you know, South Africa had this incredible change without a civil war. And that was one of the most amazing and beautiful things. But she can't ignore the problems that she sees every time she opens up a newspaper or reads a book uh, or looks out um, in her environment. And that's what this ongoing series of um, dry points has been about and etchings has been about. And um, her work is really remarkable for the um, very delicate quality of the drawing and her amazing skill with the figure. Um, she really talked about doing these almost entirely from her head so that she can really um, bring these images to life. Um, one of the, I think, great centerpieces of the print out, print in show was the print in part um, that was organized by Ellen Gallagher. And um, I thought that her vision in collaboration with um, Sarah Suzuki was really strong. And in the catalog, there's this wonderful diagram of how Ellen was thinking about all the different um, artists that she would include to the sh in the show. And she did include um, her print, um, Deluxe, which um, was published by Two Palms Press, um, coming out, I know they worked on it for a long time, um, between 2004 and 2005. And it's this um, magnificent portfolio. I think there must be 60 prints in it. And it was, I think it has the perfect title because um, when we think about that print from the 2000s or any print from the 2000s that really um, went the full nine yards in terms of the deluxe quality, the incredible amount of collaborators, the um, people who helped um, both making the prints but also applying all the little plasticine ornaments to the thing, it was a very special and important moment. And it was very nice, I think, in the exhibition to be reminded of that project and how kind of central it was to its time and how it's certainly a very memorable project. But it's a project that could only have existed with the um, unbelievable arduous collaboration of many, many people and the great financial support from the publishers at Two Palms. So it has a very important role in our culture. Um, and it comes from this very important point. But there are other distribution systems for prints. And um, my partner and I have a house in Brooklyn. And just a few weeks ago, this print appeared on one of the stoops. And I guess I attribute it to Swoon. I hope so. It's really a beautiful print. And it's another way that prints um, go out in the world. And it's, I think it's a print that um, when people walk home every day, they see it and they think about it. Um, and I know it's worked like that for me, um, that it looks different at night, it looks different during the day. And it is, I think, an incredible, um, generous gift of this artist to place this um, image in our neighborhood. Um, this is a work of um, a friend of mine. His name is Anton Wirth. And he comes, from, he comes to printmaking much more from a kind of graphic design and book arts background. But um, he, like myself, has fallen in love with engraving. And so he does these artist books um, with engraving and letterpress. And he works in Germany um, with collaborators who help him with um, some of the letterpressing. But he does all his own printing. And he's an artist who has um, very much, I think, brought the conceptual part of art together and this kind of meditation on ornament. And he's just um, published a book. Um, which is his theory of ornamentation that was published by um, Antone and his gallery, um, C.G. Berner. Um, and this is actually from a book that um, he based on a single quote by Goethe, which was about Goethe's idea of the impossibility of illustration. And I think um, in dealing with this whole idea of ornaments, we look at these images and we almost wonder, why do we understand them as flowers? And this is another um, spread by him. Um, very, very um, attentive and fastidious um, in his handling of every element of this. 
And these things go out in the world in very small editions. So they're usually in editions of 12 or 15. There are 12 or 15 people who need to have this Antone Worth book. Um, another thing that I've really identified with, um, with Antone is his responses to the prints of the past. And this is a project that was based on the um, work of the 17th century French um, portrait engraver Nontoy, um, where the portrait, um, he sort of emptied out the portrait area and then sort of concentrated on that whole idea of what surrounds those portraits. Another German artist that I think um, is very inspiring right now is Christian Baumgartner. And I remember seeing that giant print of the airplane in MoMA's show, Eye on Europe, and you know, it just blew me away. I mean, I, I, what is it, 10 feet long, 12 feet long? I mean, you just remember it as one of the most enormous things. Um, she's an artist who was trained in Leipzig and in an environment that has a very vigorous um, painting environment um, with kind of narrative painting. But she's actually um, working with um, video stills that then she transfers to woodblocks and she hand carves those. And so she's always bringing that kind of um, new technology to the old technology of the hand carving and even the hand printing that she does. And many times her um, images really do bring to light ideas about surveillance or if you really know what they're about, they often are reflections on German history in a way. There's always a kind of backstory um, to her work. And a very um, wonderful use of this kind of idea of this language that somewhat comes from the video, but really also comes from some of the oldest graphic language that we know from printmaking and woodcut. Now, an artist that um, I've recently got to know about is um, an artist named Kak Young Lee. And um, I saw her work at the print fair, and then she had a show recently at Mary Ryan Gallery. And she's an artist who um, is actually a little bit like Christian Baumgartner in that she starts out with a video. And these are dry points of Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn. And then what she does is she'll take that dry point, which happens to be on plexiglass, and she'll take it through 300 states, 400 states. And what she does is she actually traces through the plexiglass um, to, to actually get the animation, um, you know, the movement through the animation, and then she makes that into an animation. Um, so we actually have the, um, it starts out as a, as a video, it becomes a print, and then goes back into a video. And I think um, I really loved her exhibition because it was a great example that the um, video projection and the um, print installation had a kind of equal weight. And um, you can see her, she has something up at Mass Mocha right now. So these are just um, excerpts from her um, project. And one thing we can really see is um, when we think about um, you know, Kentridge's pioneering work um, using those um, videos made directly from drawings, um, she's added a kind of new twist to it, I think, by doing it through the states of an intaglio plate in that, um, there's always that kind of remnant of what's been erased. And she doesn't just end up with one or two drawings, she ends up with the whole series. So the whole series exists. And I think, I think it's been very clever and interesting the way she's brought printmaking and this video animation together. I just wanna say a few things about myself as an artist and my own studio practice because um, my own practice is very much based in the studio. I mean, what you're seeing in this image is my favorite place to be in the world, which is in my studio in Grace Church, um, sitting at a copper plate, looking at a Claude Milan engraving, um, and really trying to work out um, the thing that I'm working out on my studio. So for me, um, being a printmaker is this very kind of intimate and personal experience. Um, and I think for me, when I finished this print in 2002, one thing that happened that was very important, this is um, suit shopping, and this is the diptych, which is um, part of the diptych, and there's a triptych that goes with it. So it's a kind of narrative sequence. Um, I finished this print and I said, okay, I'm done, and um, I like this, and I didn't have a gallery at the time, and I said, I really woke up and I said, I am a publisher. I'm publishing this print, and it's my job not just to decide what the content is and to make the work, it's my job to decide how to get it out into the world. 
Um, it's my job to do those kinds of things that a publisher does. And it was, I think, an exhilarating experience because being a publisher in our culture is actually a very powerful position. And it's very different from the position I think many artists take who are, you know, you're always sort of waiting for a grant or waiting for a gallery to do something. And I think just as a conceptual thing, it really um, changed my work and um, helped me in a, in a way. And I looked, on, I looked at suit shopping and I said, well, what did I learn from it as an artist? And it really was about those lines, those parallel swelling lines. And I thought, okay, in my next project that I'm going to publish, I'm going to make those lines bigger and farther apart and see how far I can go with them. And really um, think about the work very much in terms of a kind of graphic language. So this is um, the portfolio I published in 2008. It's called Open House. And these are engravings. Um, the plates are um, 18 inches tall. And they show um, an open house and the people going through the open house. And the whole idea of the um, project is that you're supposed to figure out who the people are who live in this house by looking at their stuff. And you are supposed to um, start to think about the incidental relationships that are happening between the people who might be buying the house. And um, I think of it very much as a kind of novelistic type of project. And it's something that did take me six years to do, both in the planning and the execution of the plates. And I still have quite a bit of printing to do on the edition. Here's the upstairs of the house and the final scene in the bedroom. And um, it is a satirical work, um, but as you may be able to tell, over the bed is one of my own prints from suit shopping. And it's a satirical work in that, um, like Jane Austen or Henry James, I'm some, or Christopher Isherwood, I'm inside this world, and the critique um, bears on me as much as it would bear on anybody else. And I'd just like to end to show you um, what I'm working on right now. Because I think he was thinking about this, with this project, of this whole idea of how you can read interiors. And so I thought, what would it be like, can you read the landscape? And started thinking about gardens and manipulated type of spaces. And I thought about my own garden. And I thought it was really time to turn the satirical lens directly upon myself. And so this is the garden I have in Providence with my, at my mother's house. And the other thing that this project relates to, oh, there's my lettuce. Um, is this collection of um, 19th century transfer printed earthenware, which I love, and Ned and I have 1,500 pieces of it. And um, this is where my TV used to be. And the thing about it is, is that these are prints on clay, and I just had to get it out of my system. So I decided to do um, my own plates, and these are the shapes that I've designed um, in folded paper. And I have some of the, I started to do studies um, in wash, and line of the garden itself, and start to think about some subjects. And I don't have all of them here, but here I am in January in bed, um, looking at seed catalogs. Here I am in February, planting seeds in my kitchen, surrounded by my transferware. I'm digging out the beds. I'm training a passion vine, watering, mowing, digging dahlia tubers, and contemplating the garden in the snow. So um, my process has continued to develop out of what I started with um, open house and with suit shopping, but I've added much more working from life. And so I work on these grisaille studies outdoors, like here's my chrysanthemums at the side in um, October. And I also build these sculptural models um, of the figures and draw from them and coordinate the um, painting that I've done outside with the sculptural model, which is my final thing that I work on and here's the first state of the first engraving. And these are actually going to be printed onto tissue that's going to be transferred to the bisque-fired ceramic body that will be fired, and they'll be clear glazed and fired again. And this is my lovely colleague at RISD. And um, I, I really see myself as a cottage industry artist. And I think many of us here are. But if I have collaborators, they're not going to be helping me with the printing, because I can do that. But um, this is Larry Bush. And he's been showing me how to make the plates on the ram press, which is in the um, back to the right. And it's actually a hydraulic press. And it's like printing, except for it's with clay. And if you mess up, you can just reuse the clay. It's not wasting a $10 sheet of paper. And we actually have plates in clay. 
So I just want to end with this image um, of a plate by Claire Layton, and it's called Logging, and it's from her series, um, New England Industries, which is um, something I've looked at a lot recently because, of course, um, she was one of the few um, printmakers who took on a ceramics project to this extent. But she was also a socialist and a social realist, and she loved workers. Um, and I think that's actually something about, you know, maybe I was thinking at first about um, the garden project that something had to do with reading landscape, but I actually think it has a lot more to do with the kind of nature of labor and um, with the nature of the kind of labor that we do put on our work. So making the garden is this highly ornamental thing. It's not very useful, but it's beautiful and satisfying. And making these plates, also an ornamental thing, only marginally useful, but also, I think, um, of a certain kind of efficacy and importance in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Susan Dackerman is our final speaker. Okay, let's see how I do with the technology. That went much better than I suspected it would. <laughs> I wanted to thank Randy and the Mixit partners for inviting me. I was so happy to see the exhibition this afternoon, and I look forward to seeing it again um, later this evening. As Randy said in her introduction, I am the curator of the print collection at the Harvard University Art Museums. And it's a collection of about 65,000 prints, ranging in date from 1470 to, I can't say yesterday, but certainly the beginning months of 2012. And it is a collection that is actively cultivated so that we try to add to it by uh, purchasing prints, accepting prints as gifts. And even though my academic training is actually in 16th century Northern European prints, as Randy mentioned, I am responsible for acquiring the modern and contemporary prints for the collection. And I do it in very much the same way that I acquire prints of the 16th century. I'm often looking for similar things, similar qualities. Prints for me exist as a kind of currency, uh, a means of carrying ideas or knowledge or ideology. And, uh, you know, it could be about all different kinds of subjects, uh, politics, aesthetics, um, architecture. I mean, it, you know the, certainly the range of subjects that are presented in printmaking. And so what I thought that I would do today was talk to you about or show you some of the prints that have been acquired within the last few years by the Harvard Art Museums. We acquire prints very much in thinking about how they can be used in exhibition, in our study rooms, and most importantly for teaching. We think of our primary audience as being the student population at the university. And so a large part of my job is acting as an intermediary between the print collection and the faculty at Harvard University and trying to get them to incorporate prints into their teaching. And of course, I don't want them to show slides of the prints. What I want them to do is to come to the museum's study room 
have the print taken out of storage and be able to uh, look at it with the students there in the study room. Now, the qualities of contemporary printmaking make that difficult sometimes because as you know, it has become a very mixed media practice. And I'm showing you a print here by Ellen Gallagher called Abu Simbel. And um, I'm happy to see that Andrew showed a print from Gallagher's deluxe series. Uh, the deluxe series came out in 2004, 2005, and I was during that time, as they say, in between jobs. But when I saw the, I think it's 65 individual prints published, I thought this is one of the most important print publications of this time. Gallagher is looking at questions of uh, race and identity and representation and how all of those elements can be constructed within this really visually compelling array of images. So within my first week of work at my new job at Harvard in 2005, I called um, Two Palms, David Lazary at Two Palms and said, okay, I have a job where I have acquisition money. I would like to acquire that deluxe series. And he said that it was already gone, that it had gone primarily to museums and collectors. So and it, and it was a fairly large edition. And I, of course, I don't remember what it is now. But Andrew, do you remember? I think it's, it's at least uh, 30 sets of those 65 images. So what David Lazary, uh, who is a wonderful publisher and salesman said was, she's working on the next one and the first impression of it is yours. <laughs> and so what we ended up with was this uh, print called Abu Symbol, which is a project she did for the Freud Museum in London. She was invited to Freud's house and asked to make a work of art uh, for an exhibition about Freud's house. And she found in his library this photo gravure of the ancient Egyptian site Abu Simbel. In her typical fashion, she refashioned the image, uh, manipulating the look of the uh, ancient sculptures and actually giving them black features. Um, she added the spaceship, which is based on, or comes from Sun Ra's black, black, black exploitation film, Space is the Place. And uh, it was a film in which uh, the black population was list, lifted up by this spaceship to an astral utopia to escape the oppression of blacks by other blacks on Earth. And so in this print, she actually shows or gives reference to some of that oppression. Uh, the ancient figures have these black features as well as sit on big Cadillac gr uh, grills. Um, the figure Eunice Rivers, uh, the nurse who was complicit in the Tuskegee syphilis experiments is also depicted. And so I thought that this would be a very powerful print for teaching within uh, uh, the study room of the museum. So when I showed up, or when this print arrived, you know, we have a conservation staff at Harvard, and they're very finely trained, as you can imagine, and great specialists. So there are people who, you know, piece together ancient ceramics and ancient sculpture. They know a lot about silver and paint and paper and ink. 
except this print pre uh, presented the challenge of having blue fur on it, <laughs> which uh, they suspected, of course, is not an archival material. And just the worrying just began. And so this is a print that we actually pull out frequently to assess uh, whether it's deteriorating. And it's something that's worried about quite actively because as you can see, she's used uh, atypical materials, plasticine. We're not really sure about the life uh, of that. Homemade, the hair gel, again, uh, we suspect it's somewhat fugitive. Um, and the crystals, uh, we hope, are a little more stable. But contemporary artists present the museum with these issues and questions that then uh, need to be solved. This is another print by Ellen Gallagher in the collection called Duke, which is the brand name of a hair pomade. And she has, um, I think there are 110 individual heads there, uh, images of black men with afros that she has clipped out of magazines like Ebony um, and rearranged in this photo, photo gravure. But what she did was put the pomade on each of the uh, on each of the afros, so seeping into the paper of this print is this greasy hair product that again uh, has driven the paper conservators crazy and because this was made in 2004, actually you can see quite plainly on the back of this sheet of paper the spread of uh, the greasy substance. This is another print that was acquired within the last five years or so. Um, it's by an artist named Kent, uh, Kent Hendrickson who makes prints as well as uh, does sewing and embroidery. And a print like this, or an art object like this, when brought into the museum, again raises lots of questions and concerns. This is a rather large work of art. It's about five feet high, four feet across. Um, it's the size of a painting. It is printed on silk, and so it has the qualities of a textile, uh, along with the sewing. Um, and you know, you're all familiar with the way that museums are divided up. There are departments of painting, there are departments of prints, there are departments of textiles, there's a department of sculpture. And so an object like this, in which printmaking has been assimilated or um, combined with these other techniques really confounds the museum systems. But it was acquired by the print curator, and so it became an object within the print collection. And one of the many things that I like about it is that it is a screen print over silk. And within each of those cartouches, there, is a, there are figures or scenes appropriated from other uh, iconic printed works. So at its very center is an image based on Durer's woodcut of Mary Magdalene being assumed into the heavens. Except Kent Hendrickson in his very sinister way, in a way that he does often uh, in his artworks, is put um, hoods or capes or clothes over them, making reference to the Ku Klux Klan, um, 
and more recently, uh, Abu Ghraib. And so Mary Magdalene, instead of having this very uh, heavenly uh, assumption, has a hood over her head and the uh, cherubs around her end up looking quite sinister. But this is a print that we hang next to paintings uh, because of its scale and because of the way that it works in a gallery. This is a print by Kerry James Marshall. And um, I forget, I guess it was the uh, Globe critic quote in which it was said that um, contemporary printmaking has taken away that intimacy of small printed sheets. Well, this is a print that is of quite a large scale. It's eight feet high and 50 feet long. So, it is not only a conservation uh, concern, it's also a storage concern, something we also worry about all the time at the museum. But when I saw it, what it made me think of, what its monumental scale made me think of was the monumental prints of Albrecht Dürer. So Dürer in 1515 made a triumphal arch that was uh, 20 feet high and about 10 feet wide. And I thought Kerry James Marshall is working on a very similar scale here and attempting to make a monumental work in the history of printmaking. Now, as I said, this is a kind of print that in a museum we wonder how we're going to store such a thing and also how we're going to exhibit such a thing. Because it's printed in color, uh, we are reluctant to show it for more than three or six months at a time. We don't want the colors to fade. But to exhibit it means finding appropriate gallery space. So even though this was acquired in 2007, it will actually be shown for the very first time this fall because it requires uh, a gallery of its own. So we have found a gallery space with a wall that is 50 feet long and it will be the only artwork in the gallery. Because it's hard with something like this. I mean, what else do you actually hang with it? But we decided that it was not only worth acquiring, but it was also worth um, exhibiting because of all of the stories that we could tell about with it, art historical stories. I mean, as you can see, it depicts an interior uh, there are a number of black men sitting in what looks like a living room, drinking coffee, eating. You see the interior walls, the exterior walls of the building. Um, and I think one of the things that the artist, Carrie James Marshall, has done in this print is actually try to show all of these different genres uh, in the history of art as well as in the history of printmaking. So to just break it down a little, you have these interior walls which allow you to talk about uh, abstraction. You have this interior scene which is very much like a genre scene. I mean, if you think about 17th century Dutch interiors, this is what they portray, a bunch of people sitting around eating and drinking. But our expectations here are um, overturned in a way because we don't expect to see, however many it is, six black men sitting within this interior interacting in the way that they are. You also see a still life on the uh, coffee table. 
And I think one of the things that the artist is doing is sort of showing off his knowledge of the history of art as well. The figure on the far left, left <clears throat> sitting on the floor, sits in a pose very similar to um, the female figure in Manet's Déjeuner Soubler, the luncheon in the grass. Um, and I think the expectation is that the viewers will recognize this. And so uh, it's a print that allows you to talk about, <coughs> excuse me, the history of prints and the history of architecture, uh, the history of prints and the history of art in general. I mean, here you have the exterior of the building, landscape, again, this exploration of abstraction in a way. Uh, it's a pretty phenomenal print, and I hope you will come over to see it when, it is up, when it's up um, this fall in the galleries. <clears throat> because we are playing to an audience that is uh, in their 20s primarily. Whenever I acquire a print for the collection, I am thinking about how am I going to get the Harvard undergraduates interested in this uh, material? Um, and I mean, I think about it for prints in the 16th and 17th century as well. But one of the ways that's been interesting and fun is to go after the kind of printed objects that uh, the artists of um, uh, in their 20s and 30s are making. And so this uh, skateboard deck by Ryan McGinnis that has uh, stickers that were printed via screen print adhered to the skateboard deck. And then um, this screen printed uh, t-shirt that the Harvard students themselves made uh, and, and has actually already appeared in a show um, at the Harvard Art Museums. So, we collect all kinds of uh, different materials uh, in the, within this, under this category or under this umbrella of printmaking. And to speak to some of the issues that have been brought up by the previous speakers about how printmaking actually has begun to inf infiltrate the way that we think about all art making media. Uh, we are in the final preparations of an exhibition that will be, that will focus on Jasper John's painting, The Dutch Wives. It is uh, an exhibition that originated with an, with an art history class taught by Jennifer Roberts at, uh, in the art history department and four students, four juniors and um, they looked closely at this painting and determined that many of its strategies, many of John's strategies, his painting strategies, actually are informed by printmaking. You know, in that hierarchy that Andrew mentioned, Painting always comes above printmaking. And in the way that historically we've talked about Jasper Johns is the paintings come first and then the prints are often ways of reproducing those paintings or working out other ideas around the paintings. But this exhibition posits that the paintings are actually informed by the strategies of printmaking by repetition, by sequence and seriality, by indexicality, by layering, by all of those processes that you know so well as printmakers that were necessary for Johns to have worked out in order to come to the conclusion in some of his paintings, and in particular in this exhibition, The Dutch Wives. Um, so I'm going to end there, uh, and thank you all very much for coming.
um, I think we've been given a really marvelous, both at uh, the breadth and the depth of the uh, range of the, what we have is the challenges. We've seen the challenges of curating from Susan, the delights of making from Andrew, and the um, intense interest in investigation of what a critic might um, experience. I'd like to open up the panel for their discussion of each other's comments, and we'll also have question and answers at this time. So do we have any um, remarks from the panelists to each other at this point? Should we, should, should we open it up we, to the we, audience? We talked a lot in the car coming up. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think one of the um, really interesting uh, themes that has come across is I opened up with a comment from a, the um, Ken Johnson, the critic at the Times, who said that he felt that the intimate print was maybe now an endangered species. But I think that uh, given tonight's comments, we have challenge that comment, both in terms of the intimate print and also looking at how we might encompass and deal with the monumentality of some contemporary prints. So um, any questions that we might be able to respond to? There are mics at the, at the um, end of the aisles. Is this on? It doesn't, ah, there we go, hi there. Um, I'm Ted Allier, I'm one of the uh, members of Mixit, and uh, one of the things that me and my, the printmakers that I have, I'm, I'm relatively young, I'm only 40, um, but one of the things that we've been talking about is uh, um, going over what exactly does um, printmaking in, entail, and uh, Andrew being a, um, an engraver and stuff like that, that's a, as a, as a printmaker, that's a traditional form. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and stuff like that. And one of the things that we've been discussing is, or at least um, we've been attempting to discuss, is um, inkjet and uh, other forms of technology. Is that printmaking? And uh, what does that mean for uh, curation? What does that mean for production? Um, it's a relatively quick process because you can produce something um, and it gets printed almost immediately. Um, what does that do for the... Uh, the work that goes into the print, and um, I guess you could almost say that the, um, since you can whip it off pretty quickly, um, what does that mean for the immediacy of it? I mean, it's, uh, that you can have um, very fugitive uh, statements made, um, very, very uh, contemporary that basically immediately fade because they're no longer relevant. So what do you think about that? Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll dive in, I guess. Okay, thank you. So, um, you know, I, I come to it from the point of view of um, working with graduate students quite a bit and really seeing um, what kind of applicants we get who want to be in a printmaking program as opposed to the kind of applicants who may want to be in a photography program. And so, um, you know, we've really seen photography dramatically change from darkroom photography um, over the past years. But I think photography's changed to a great extent that um, there's been an unbelievable technical perfection, but that technical perfection has led to a certain uniformity in the actual object. And I think that's been an interesting thing for photographers to come to grips with, because um, when it was silver gelatin prints or platinum prints or stuff done with four by five cameras or eight by 10 or whatever, it was very there was a very strong specific charge to the object as it was made. And I think that um, print artists who are turning to um, using computers to make works on paper um, are, I think, really quite experimental and very much you know, running things through again and again and again, um, making extremely particular choices about the paper itself, um, having um, very, very specific ideas about what that ink layer looks like. I mean, there's a sense that those are, if you know the difference between a stone litho and an offset litho, then you're going to be really struck by the lustrous beauty of what that's available in certain inkjet printing. And then I think um, the other thing that has been very um, remarkable, and I actually I just saw it um, with Diane Victor's work yesterday, she was actually doing these images where the figures were done with shaped etching plates, so highly embossed figures, 
and the figures were casting shadows, which were highly detailed with maps type of images, and those were um, printed with inkjet. And I do think that um, you know, testing those tolerances of how things are made um, is something that you know, computers are you know, giving us just another range of, of ways of making things. I, I just want to add to that. I mean, I certainly see inkjet prints as prints as right. well. I mean, um, the fact that they're produced as multiples, you can have an exactly repeatable statement. Uh, the form of production, I don't think, undermines the, or doesn't um, exclude them from the category of printmaking. Now, again, in the museum context, we worry all the time about how fugitive that inkjet ink is. But I guess it's getting better. <laughs> <laughs> because people are worried about it. Right, right. It doesn't necessarily mean, though, that people are using the better ink, right. always. <laughs> I don't know where you came from, the person who is. So there you are. Yeah, um, and I don't think you're, I'm not for a minute insinuating that this is what your question was about, but, and, and, and I, I don't, you know, um, have the kind of, again, background that um, both Andrew and Susan have brought to this conversation this evening. But um, I guess as a, as a critic, I've never found it particularly useful or instructive in terms of, again, thinking about this kind of larger question of uh, cultural agency, cultural probes, um, to sort of police boundaries about like what is, what is a print or for that matter what is sculpture or what is installation or what is photography. I mean there is a kind of, again, I think we are in a kind of material and conceptual co kind of promiscuity and I, I um, I guess that's something that I think is is, is interesting to, um, it's an interesting and challenging time to be uh, thinking about and engaging all of these issues. Um, and certainly, um, I mean, I'm, I'm really intrigued by artists, and I mean, Andrew certainly had a very vivid example in his um, presentation this evening, but I mean, you know, the return to letterpress and, and, and using very traditional and um, very, um, historical legacy kinds of uh, materials and methodologies. Um, uh, artists who are photographers who are actually kind of using old found snapshots and then incorporating them into new, new media or I think it's, is it, um, is it Kerry Walker or Kelly Walker's where she's actually providing files for people so that suddenly you're making prints that are not only um, about seriality and, and reproduction, but they're also about scalability. I mean, you can print your print at whatever scale you want. So there's, it's a really interesting time, I think, to be involved in contemporary art. And, um, and, and again, I just try to come in through the lens of, of how these notions of, of, of reproduction, of seriality, of, 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 of exchange, of transaction, and how the print has been a very sort of generative form in public space. And, so, I don't know, I think it's a, I don't have to struggle with the, the conservation issues or, <laughs> but. I just, I, I want to just tie your comments back to uh, the Ken Johnson quote. I think that his nostalgia for a certain kind of intimacy with a certain kind of prints is a false nostalgia. Uh -huh. That the print he imagines is not the only print uh -huh. that existed in those better years of the past, mm -hmm. whenever that was. Mm -hmm. um, and that there was all kinds of experimentation and difference in scale and technique then as well. So uh, I don't know. I see things more on a continuum than there being a sharp break between prints of the past and the contemporary print world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I, in adding to that, I think one of the interesting things that was brought up tonight, one of the interesting ideas is that it used to be when you talked about the hierarchy of painting versus prints, one of the reasons that painting was considered superior to printmaking was because of its unique quality. And the print could be multiplied and therefore was uh, less valued less. And now we're seeing in contemporary printmaking the value of the multiple 
being um, at uh, being uh, so highly regarded, that it's that multiplicity, that ability to reproduce that is making the art what in fact it is. So and when you talk about a continuum, it's also sort of this interesting overlap of, um, of cycles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Questions, more questions? Here's one. Uh, is that good? Um, so as a graduating printmaker now in my last year, um, something that came up in, in uh, both Andrew and Susan's talk was about, um, uh, well, the, well, about um, modes of distribution and things like that. And I was really glad to see the slide of Swoon because she's one of the reasons I became a printmaker because I was so attracted to realizing that there was um, this democratic possibility of prints, but then in the process of my education, I was also so drawn to the exquisiteness of a, of a fine print rather than the uh, sort of wheat pasted uh, version of it. Um, and so that uh, put me in a conundrum in certain ways, um, uh, graduating and trying to f figure out where is the place that democratic political fine prints fit in. And I'm interested in um, uh, Andrew, where your interest in publishing your own work, where that led you, and Susan, uh, where did you come into contact with some of these incredible prints that you decided to acquire, and how has the ability to be distributed, um, how has that uh, influenced you guys in uh, your connection with prints and things like that? Why don't you go first, and then I'll... The <laughs> um, I, I guess, you know, part of, of being an artist is having a certain amount of self-knowledge and thinking about um, looking out in the world and seeing what's out there. And then from that point of view of self-knowledge, thinking about what you might put out there that would f belong but be very much your own. And then starting to think about, well, who are the people who really need to see this work? You know, so my friend Anton, who makes those incredibly fastidious books, there really aren't that many people who need to see them, but he gets to them. You know, and, and with my engravings, I was really, I love these 17th century old master prints. And, um, you know, I, when I heard that somebody from the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris saw one and immediately said Claude Melon, I realized I had hit my target audience. You know, that's not everybody, but it really is, um, you know, and I felt, so I think it's important to think about where the work goes in terms of who you really want to see. And, you know, Providence um, in the 90s had this incredible postering phenomenon where um, people were living in these uh, buildings, they had these bands, they were advertising these shows, but the posters were gorgeous. I mean, they were, in, we all collected them because you just couldn't resist them of the beauty of the graphic language in those posters. It was like Toulouse-Lautrec in its, but it was of the 90s in Providence, you know? And it was, it was something that included so many people. And they hit the target audience. Everybody loved those posters. So I think it's really, a, and they knew, what, they knew what they were doing in that way. I think that's, that's self-knowledge and sort of seeing where you want your work to go and where it needs to go is really important. Um, to answer your, um, to address the part of your question about distribution, um, it's very hard to make the kinds of decisions about what's going to be acquired by the museum and what's not going to be acquired. It is very easy to become overwhelmed by the abundance of contemporary prints, and I mean, for me, it's just prints, being made at this moment. And it's not possible for me to uh, assess it all. And so I see contemporary art in very specific environments, or contemporary prints in very specific environments. I see it in museums when I see a print show. I often know the artist or the publisher, and if I see something that I think would be important for 
the fog to have. You know, I will make a phone call in that way. Um, I go to the various print fairs that happen. The one in New York in the fall is probably the most important one for me. And it's where I see a huge array of work that then over the course of that year, I will go out and try to learn more about or see if I could track down other work by a particular artist. That Kerry James Marshall print I saw leaning against the gallery wall at Jack Shaman's gallery years ago. And there was another artist's workup at the time that had, it was on its way into a storage facility. And I asked the gallerist if it was a print that was available. And he said, he didn't know me, we had never met before, and he said, I don't think that it is. I thought, okay. So three months later, I went back. I saw him again, and I said, do you remember me, Jack? I, at last time I was here, you had that Kerry James Marshall leaning against the wall. Is it still available? He didn't really know. <laughs> three months later, I went back. I mean, every time I went to New York, I essentially went into his gallery. And eventually, he said, you know, it's here. Why don't I show it to you? Literally, three years pass in these visits in which uh, you know, it's, it becomes this difficult negotiation and all. So it's a, the distribution process system is very complicated and it is far from ideal at both, at, at all levels. I mean, uh, you work within the gallery system and, uh, it's, it's actually why I don't think we can complain too much about this show, <laughs> because it's such a valiant effort on the part of the team of curators at MoMA to sift through an incredible amount of stuff and put together a credible narrative. You know, and it's just one narrative. If you think about it as an ecosystem, every museum makes its own narrative of what contemporary prints are. And um, you know, I think it's, it's great that um, curators aren't just imitating each other and all buying the same prints. You know, and this, that's why I think this was just one narrative, and it's really, it is a compelling narrative in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But I would just get, you know, put your work in as many shows as possible, and people, you know, the more uh, visible your work is, the more likely uh, people are going to see it and talk about it, and it will show in other venues and get distributed. Any other questions, and then we'll... Um, I'd like to ask Susan and anybody else who'd like to jump in, in the context of what you've been talking about, where do you see the monoprint, the unique print? In the same places, actually. I see them in the print fairs. I see them in uh, galleries. Oh, where I see them in the hierarchy. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, because, you know, as I said in uh, my introductory comments, prints for me are a kind of currency for ideas. And for that currency to have value, there has to be a lot of it. And so um, I think monotypes and monoprints are uh, interesting as well, but don't necessarily function in the same way. Uh, so I'm not sure where I would put them in the hierarchy, but I mean, we do uh, acquire them as well. Do you make monoprints, monotypes? No, but I think in New England, we have just um, such an amazing legacy because of Michael Mazur. And I did see that in the Mix It show, that there's, there's the monoprints, really um, brings something to life from him. And so that's a really um, part of, I think, our culture. Um, when I went out to Southern Graphics in St. Louis, they have this unbelievable tradition of colographs because of Peter Marcus, who now lives in Rhode Island. But, you know, and, and um, it was great to see that. So I think there are places, and I, I know that um, at our museum, we have a class, well, in our pr program, the painting department has a class called Painterly Prints. 
And one thing that you know, we want to do to serve our students more is actually collect monoprints for them. And um, Sue Scott, who publishes a lot of monoprints, was nice enough to give us quite a few. And they've been amazingly useful for our students. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's definitely something to look out for. Any last question? We'll take one more if we have it. Okay, well, I hope you'll get to visit the exhibition. Thank you to our wonderful panelists, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>